closer up um, view from uh, the monitor over there. But this is um, called the Manitou Incline. It's in Colorado Springs. So I had the pleasure of climbing up this thing, Incline, last Sunday. And I did it with a group of friends, uh, people who I run with. And so most of us are in shape, pretty good shape, running shape. And um, so, but you look at this from the, from the base of this mountain, and it's daunting. And, and there's 2,000, see, what is it? 2,268, 2,000, yeah, 2,268 2, steps to get to the top, okay? But we all had a similar goal, and the goal was to get to the top of this thing. This used to be a old railway thing to, uh, there's a, like a hydroelectric plant, water plant up there, and so that's what it was used for. So as we climbed, it reminded me of, I also did this last year for the first time. And we're about halfway up, and this young boy in, who's in yellow, you can see he's sort of bending over. And he was eight years old, and I knew because we all encouraged him to make it to the top. He wanted to make it to the top. But every time he took a step, he would stand there and he would look down, and he would assess this next step. And it took everything he had to step. And, there, and one reason, because it might not seem like a big deal, but I mean, every time you step up, you're, you're lifting your body weight, whatever that is, okay? And also, they vary, too. I mean, some of these steps are really high. And I'm, as you could probably tell, I'm not a tall person. I'm a short person. And, um, and then some of them had ice in between because we did just get snow up there. So the whole middle area was, it was filled with snow in between the metal or the, um, the wood um, rail things that were there. But he, the way he did get to the top. And the way he did this was to break down this goal into baby steps, doing one at a time. And that's how he did it. Uh, the other thing, too, is that um, sometimes we stumble. So when I was going up it on Sunday, and I'm not running, I'm just hiking up. And, um, and you can see there's this great, I don't know how well you can see, but there's these grates in between. Um, because they had water runoff here. And, um, and so every, I don't know, 100 steps or something like that, they would have a grate. So it was no big deal. The only time it was an issue was when there was snow and ice here and you felt like you might slip on it because it's metal. But I'm walking up the step and my shoe got caught on the front. And so my shoe was stuck where it was and I was going forward. And so I fell. I had totally wiped out. <laughs> but I got up. It was a little embarrassing. But I got up. And I just continued. I wasn't too hurt. Um, so anyway, as we're working towards our goal, our goal was to make it to the top of 2,278 stairs that we just took one step at a time, and sometimes we stumbled. Closer to the top, uh, this was the hardest part because we actually had a false peak, so meaning that we were climbing to the top, what we thought was the top, and it wasn't. And so that was a little discouraging. We knew that that was going to happen, but you, you just don't expect it when it happens. And so some of us were faster and some of us were slower than each other. We were actually a, basically a community of people who were doing this together with a shared goal. And so these three people, it's Roxy, Shauna, and, um, and my rabbit, um, he, um, they joined hands and they were going to finish this together. And they did. And the thing was, is they got to the top. We all got to the top. Actually, by the time they got up there, I was gone because it was really cold and it was starting to snow. And, um, and we just, uh, we didn't have the proper clothing to wait. But they stood there, someone captured their picture of as this community of people. Here we have three who worked towards this common goal. We all made it to the top and it was thrilling and we were proud. But the other thing, too, is we knew there was more behind us to, to conquer. The rest was a little bit easier. So the reason why I'm sharing this is because um, as I look around here, 
I mean, we're, we're different. We're diverse. Um, some have been uh, with the project for decades. Some are, are newer to the project. Uh, we come from different parts of the world. But we are a community of people who are working to, towards a shared goal. And to me, that shared goal is for FreeBSD to be successful. And, um, and success may be, uh, you may define it a different way. I mean, there's corporations here who build their products on FreeBSD. There's, um, or you may be using it for your own infrastructure. Or there's users here who may just want more control of the operating system, of the computer that they're using, or maybe they are interested in learning more about uh, becoming more uh, better systems programmers. And so there's many reasons and many uh, you know, definitions of what success is, but it's still our goal is to make uh, FreeBSD successful. So who are we? Uh, if you don't know, uh, so, so the FreeBSD Foundation started in March 2000. The, the president founder will be here tomorrow. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to um, come today. Uh, that's Justin Gibbs. Uh, we are a nonprofit, and so a U.S.-based uh, tax classification is a 501c3. It does mean we're for the public good. Uh, we're based in Boulder, Colorado, but we are a global um, team of people all around the world. So we have people in Taiwan and Alaska and Ukraine and the UK and Germany and, and France and we're all over the world. And, it's, and we're a team of people who are really passionate about FreeBSD and ensuring that it is successful. So this is our purpose. I mean, it really is to support the long-term sustainability of FreeBSD. And our, some of the key things is really just making sure it's secure and innovative. So when you think, or um, I mean, when we think of what we need to do to fulfill our mission, I mean, it goes back to it's daunting. There's a lot, and there's a lot that needs to be done in this project to really help lift it. And so we try to step in and, and fill those gaps and also assess what is gonna be the most impactful to the project. Because we, we don't have a lot of funding. And I'll share that in just a sec. Um, but the key things that we work on is, is software development. And um, Ed will go into more of what we're doing there. We do fund a lot of different projects. We also have a big team of people. In fact, Ed um, was telling me the other day, we were I forgot, we were talking about staffing and resourcing. And he was like, I have 23 people on my team. And so this is from like people who maybe are just spending a few hours a week or a month. But really, I mean, we do, we have a broad number of, of um, you know, um, capabilities really on our team. The second largest area that we support is advocacy and education. And so I'll show you some of the work we've been doing in advocating for FreeBSD, getting the word out that FreeBSD is here and it's relevant and why you should be using it, whether you're an individual or a corporation. Um, though I, I will actually put keeping FreeBSD secure maybe above these because that is so critical, especially now uh, when there's so many uh, issues like what uh, Pavel was talking about earlier. And so one of our responsibilities is to make or help ensure that FreeBSD stays secure. Um, enhancing CI and infrastructure. Uh, we do have a full-time person, who, well, Lee Wen, he's here somewhere back there, and, um, and he works on, uh, on our continuous integration. Um, and we also support the, the uh, FreeBSD infrastructure. So what that means is like right now, most of the project servers are in New Jersey, and so we're modernizing it, and um, updating a lot of that equipment. And so we will uh, purchase the equipment that's needed, and then you have a cluster admin team who actually will set things up. And so we've actually been funding um, some of that effort right now. And all of that, ha actually, I'll just put this out, that NYI has been graciously um, providing like four racks for free for us. Uh, we are a legal entity, and so the project is all volunteers. And so they're not a legal entity, they're not a corporation. And so we could actually represent them. And so we do that like with NDAs, we review a lot of contracts and 
uh, different types of engagements. Uh, if there's a patent issue, then uh, we can help step in with that. Um, and then the last thing is, is here. This is what we do is we try to bring people together either in person or, um, or online, like through the pandemic, we're trying to add a lot more like ways to engage and uh, share knowledge and collaborate, whether it's in person, though I think in, in person is, is one of the best opportunities for that. And, um, but also uh, going to conferences and, um, and we're actually trying to get more people to give talks about FreeBSD just to get the word out. So, um, and I put building bridges just because one thing too that we help is we work with uh, users like corporations, connect with developers and to get like the support they need or even have questions and so we will help facilitate that. So this is, what I did was I took our budget, this year our budget is 2.7 million and I, just to show you how we're spending the money and so you can see that over half the uh, budget is going towards software development work, and that's actual software development work. And then there's um, another, I can't read it without my glasses, but I think it's a quarter, 25% um, of our budget is allocated to advocacy and education. And education is an area that we do want to grow, and, um, and we want to do, uh, 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 provide like training, um, classes like uh, Coursera or uh, LinkedIn Learning type of classes like uh, how to become a de FreeBSD developer or the internals of FreeBSD. I'd love to recruit uh, Kirk to help us with that. So, and then you can see where um, infrastructure, a uh, certain part of our funding goes there. So I am currently working on next year's budget and um, it will be smaller than this because right now, so like I said, our budget is 2.7 million. We did plan on investing uh, more than we knew we'd be able to take in. Um, our fundraising is still around the same. Next year, actually, we will be bringing more money uh, just from the Sovereign Tech Fund uh, that we're receiving more of that investment next year. And, um, and also the laptop project will bring in more money and we'll talk about that later. So, when, so I wanna ask a question. Um, so the summit's been happening for a few years now out here in California, Bay Area, November usually. <laughs> so how many have there been? I know you have to think. Oh, Ed knows. Okay, who else, who else knows? George has to know. Seven. <laughs> so one thing is that it actually said this at the beginning, at the opening. So here, I want to share this with you. So, um, so when so we're organizing this event, and this is the one event. So this and the Ottawa uh, Developer Summit are the two that the foundation help organize and fund. And so I started thinking, like, when did this start, and why? And so what it was started back in 2011. I believe George Neville Neal did start this, and he is here. Thank you, or welcome back. <laughs> and so, and it was called the Vendor Summit. I think it was because it was a, so there was another event that was in the area that George was coming out for. But anyway, it, it was here in this area because there's a lot of tech here, obviously. And so it was a very small. Re it's always been a small regional um, event. And over the years, you can see, if, if you can read this, uh, it switched between being called a vendor summit and a, a developer summit. And it was just dependent on if it was associated with a conference or not, because Meet BSD was also happening out here every other year. And then in uh, 2016, uh, we started, uh, or, well, that year we, it was organized by IX Systems, but we also uh, paid for that event. We started, um, I can't remember what year we, it transitioned over to the foundation. But you'll see this, so it's been Vendor Summit for the last few years. Some of them were online because of the pandemic. And then uh, we actually changed the name this year, if you noticed. So this year we call it the FreeBSD Summit. And the reason why we did that was to make it more inclusive and welcoming. And we have aspirations that we, we hope that we'll grow those. So we would love, I mean, we would love to have like a FreeBSD conference. Uh, but we really need to have the funding and the resources in order to be able to do that. So 
how have we grown? So is this still, yeah, this is still working. Um, so that's me, <laughs> if you can tell. And uh, so I joined the foundation in 2005, and I was the first employee. So we had been around for five years, and, and Justin needed help because he had a day job. And so, um, so anyway, we met, and, um, and the board hired me as the first employee, and uh, which is really interesting because, I mean, when you're an employee for a company, usually, you know, your HR, they know what to do. And so this was very new to me. This wasn't my background. I, came, I was an engineer before this. And, um, and so there's a lot of federal and state laws you have to follow. So, uh, so there was a lot of that the, the first year. But since then, we have really grown. And so this is just part of our team. And, um, and actually, Ed will... Um, include a lot of the other team members when he gives his uh, portion of the talk. And, but it shows you sort of the diversity of the people who we have on the team now and diversity in like what they are working on. So we have, now we have a technical writer. Um, we have Alice, program manager. Um, Moyne has now joined us full time. Uh, we have Lee Wen here. Isaac's a new um, software engineer, Caustic. And, um, and so this is just to show faces of who is part of the team, but also how we have really grown over the years. I include this picture. Some of you may uh, remember this. We've never uh, posted this. But um, the last core team, they were out in Colorado, and we did some training. And it was the first time that they actually worked with us. We were working with a coach, and we worked um, separately and then also together, um, depending on, on the meeting. That way we could be individual and, and the core um, could work on their own uh, growth and plans and ideas. And, but I had taken them up to this area, it's called NCAR. You may have heard of it. And, um, and so I was sort of struck by when they were standing there overlooking the plains of Colorado. And I put here, our future looks bright because really what we were doing together was um, we were just really seeing the potential of what we could do as leaders of the project and also how to goal set and just things that we, we as a project hadn't done um, that much before. And so I, I really liked this image of these, um, you know, the few core members who were able to come out. So I'm going to rush, not rush, but I'm going to go through some of these uh, fairly quickly. Uh, but to show you our goals, and we are updating these for 2025, but they're going to be very similar. And really, when you look at the overall picture of, um, or theme, really, of what our goals, it's really to increase the adoption of FreeBSD and increase the visibility of FreeBSD. And so I'm going to share some of uh, how we're doing that through our marketing efforts and then Ed and, actually, and Alice will talk about the laptop support and some of the other work that actually will fill or feed into this. Um, and then also uh, raising $2 million, uh, a year, and we would love to get to that. I think right now we're on track to raise about $1.3 million. And, um, and so we're looking at different ways of doing that. And, uh, but if, you haven't, if you're a corporation and you haven't, given us funding, we would appreciate it because it, uh, we use that to uh, support uh, the work that we're doing. And, so, and we're also uh, working on improving our operations uh, this year and going into next. So I want to talk a little bit about marketing because I, mean, I think when I look around here, I mean, most of us are engineers, developers, and, um, and I know when I was a developer, you know, you sort of poo-pooed marketing a little bit. But the thing is, is that marketing is so important because you may design or develop or implement like the coolest feature in FreeBSD, but if no one, usually you'll be, you know, you're happy just sitting at your desk working on it and continuing to improve on it. And so what we're trying to do is help shine a light on the work that you all are doing. And so we try not to really refer to it as marketing, we refer to it as advo advocacy. And so, and I just list a bunch of things here of um, how it really does enable the technology, but also helps us get funding, and it helps recruit more people to the project, which is really important. And so some of the stats, just to show um, that we did grow our marketing team over the year, and 
uh, they exceeded um, or coming close to exceeding uh, the goals that we set out for this year, which was 33% uh, over what we had done last year. We started uh, tracking the metrics so we could see were, you know, were we gaining more visibility and engagement, and we were. And so I don't know if you can read these numbers, but it, from like uh, on the left, it's how much content that we um, have provided, and then, um, can, oh, the number of case studies too. And so also, we are increasing the number of case studies. So also, if you work for a company that has an um, interesting story, actually any story, what we're trying to do is just get more corporate stories out there of how you're using FreeBSD successfully. It makes a difference. I mean, if other companies see how you're using it, maybe they have a similar uh, type of problem that they're trying to solve. So having these stories out there are really helpful. Uh, social media, we really increased our social media this year. And, um, and I won't go through numbers, but it's just really to show you how um, we've been increasing this effort. And this is, earned media is like um, articles that others are writing about us or FreeBSD. And then I just included this slide because uh, we were really noticing as we were increasing this that people were making uh, positive comments about like, what's going on at the foundation? Because we're hearing from them a lot more. And, um, and so it was generating excitement, which is good because it's, we're generating excitement. The, the people who are excited also are the people who are doing this work. And so it's just, it's a good or positive ref reflection back on them. And so and he, here's a list or the logos of our partners for this year. And um, if you work for a company and you don't see your logo up here, we would love to get uh, financial support from you. So I'll just end this with, let me look at what the time is. Um, okay, I went over just a little bit. But really, you know, you're wondering, well, how can I help? Yeah, because I mean, we're, our purpose is to help you, right? You're our stakeholders and our whole purpose to support you folks in, in different capacities. But we also need help from you. So besides, of course, the financial support, um, but to be our lighthouse. And when I say our lighthouse, I mean for FreeBSD. So we need you, if you're using FreeBSD, whether you're an individual or you're a corporation, to shine a light back on FreeBSD. And how can you do that? You could give a talk, you could write a blog post, you could social media. Uh, one thing, I don't know if Medify is still here, but the thing that I love about Medify is, I don't know if you gathered from Ian's talk this morning, uh, when he said, like, he's told that something won't work, that he'll, like, he wants to get it to work, like, to prove people wrong. And so he will try something, and he might be using Linux, and it doesn't work, and then he'll switch to FreeBSD, and then it does work, and then he'll actually write a post on LinkedIn, and he will, like, you know, shout uh, about the thing that he did. And so I love that, and we need that. The other ways that you help is to be more involved with the project. I mean, if you all are here, you are obviously engaged, but that's one thing that really helps is, is being engaged with the community. And, uh, and finally, um, upstreaming your code. And, you know, so, um, give some of your changes back and also helps you stay current and you have other people test your code. And um, so those are sort of the key ways that you can help. That's all I'm going to say. If you're interested in climbing the Manitou Incline, I'd be happy to, um, to be your guide. I love, I mean, it's quite a challenge. <laughs> but thank you. And now Ed will talk about all the work that we're doing in the technology group, though I guess. And one thing, yeah, we kept forgetting to tell you about, you probably saw this when you checked in. So we did print the uh, 30th anniversary um, of the FreeBSD Journal. We do have hard copies back here. Please feel free to grab one if you want to bring some back with you. I think we brought 40, so we have quite a few. And, um, and we also have uh, these cool pens. <laughs> I feel like a salesperson here. But no, really, it's the, uh, um, I mean, the pens are to show your love for FreeBSD. And it's also part of our advocacy effort. So thank you.
Okay. So um, one little correction. I'm not going to talk about all of the technology work that we're taking on. I'm going to pick a couple of uh, items to, to talk about in a little bit more depth. Um, and Alice will talk about some of our um, uh, sort of larger scale efforts um, tomorrow uh, and the way that we're, we're ramping up our uh, ability to execute on things. So with that, um, I'll just mention uh, the leadership team in the technology group now. Um, so. Uh, Alice, uh, I mentioned and, and Deb mentioned earlier, has joined us uh, relatively recently as a program manager and she's going to be um, leading the, the, the bigger projects that we're taking on. So we'll get into that a little bit more um, later on and Joe um, uh, continues to, to work uh, to, to oversee a lot of our individual project grants. So as Deb mentioned, uh, I, I um, have a fairly large team right now and the, the faces on here are slightly different um, perhaps than um, what's on Deb's slide just because of the way that some people, um, we have some people who are full-time employees working for the foundation, we have some people who have uh, long-term contracts for us, um, and then we have some people who work for us on a, um, uh, a much more sort of intermittent um, part-time basis. Um, as Deb mentioned, sometimes only a few hours um, a month, but we like to have relationships with people who have very specific skills so that if we need to be able to put some resources on a security issue, say, um, we have a contract in place and we have a relationship where we can, um, we can make use of someone who has specific technical skills. And so, I mean, you can see uh, John and Mark uh, on this list, um, both of whom don't spend a lot of time working for the foundation, but on occasion we have like a beehive security issue um, and John will be able to spend some, um, some funded time to take on things as necessary. Um, and so on, on here, um, since the last time we were here uh, in 2023, um, Olivier Sertner has joined us um, working on a lot of different uh, kernel, kernel topics. Um, you've, you've seen some of that work uh, recently and Alice will talk a little bit about some of the, the work we're going to be doing um, in the future. Um, Tom Jones as well. Uh, Tom worked on our VPP port uh, initially and is working on some wireless things at the moment. Uh, Moyne has joined us uh, full time uh, for now. Moyne has, has had a long term contract relationship with the foundation on different, um, different specific projects, but Moyne is now uh, working for us on an ongoing basis um, for now. And um, then Isaac is a, our most recent uh, uh, developer working on userland, um, userland work, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the things that, that he's taking on um, a little bit later. And so we have um, a few folks who are continuing on individual funded project grants. So these are either um, projects we've solicited, or in a lot of cases, it's sort of unsolicited inbound proposals where someone says, I'd like to work on, on some project and there's a, a beneficial, um, uh, th there's a benefit to FreeBSD of the work that they're proposing. And so we'll um, work out a, a way to, to bring them on as a, a grant uh, recipient. Um, and so I won't talk about the, um, the specific projects here, but these, these folks are, um, have, have projects mentioned um, in progress for us at the moment. So over the last year, um, the chart on the left you can see um, shows commits in the source tree over the last year that indicate that they are sponsored. Um, and so as the, the uh, fine print at the bottom there, the asterisk uh, says, about half of the commits in the source tree um, these days indicate that they're sponsored by someone. Um, and of those sponsored commits, the foundation is responsible for a little over a quarter of them, and then you can see uh, the, the the other names uh, going around the chart there. So Netflix does a lot of work uh, still. Um, Clara and uh, folks that they work with is um, contributing an awful lot uh, to FreeBSD. Um, we have two CPU vendors um, listed here, ARM and AMD, um, and I'll get into AMD's work in um, a little bit. And then there's some academic uh, um, supporters. Uh, or, or sponsors and um, other uh, vendors. Um, you can see NetGate does um, a lot of sponsored work in the network stack, um, and then uh, Chelsea, um, NavDeep has, uh, it, it consistently uh, contributes quite a lot to, to FreeBSD. Um, so I think we have 
a pretty good um, uh, mix of, of people contributing sponsored work. Um, historically, the foundation's efforts have been focused more on the source tree than, than other areas, um, although we have uh, increasingly focused on, um, on ports of late. Um, and so there's a number of important ports that are in our collection that are ma being maintained by um, foundation staff or contractors. So things like CPU microcode, um, we're, we're taking on uh, keeping that up to date when there's uh, microcode to address vulnerabilities in, in CPUs, things like that. Um, uh, Joe is the maintainer of the Emacs uh, ports. Um, Li Wen maintains a lot of the, the CI Jenkins uh, uh, infrastructure, and um, Moyne has historically done uh, a bunch of work in, in ports as well. So I think as as part of sort of um, a holistic approach of supporting FreeBSD um, as a complete system, um, uh, as we've been able to increase the amount of uh, folks that we have working uh, for or with us, um, we, we've naturally taken on more work in the ports collection. Another thing that the foundation has done quite a bit of work with um, is GSOC, and um, Joe spends quite a bit of, uh, of time uh, supporting our, our GSOC efforts, and so this is a list of the projects that went, um, went on this year. And as you can see, there's uh, mentors here. Many of the mentors uh, listed on this list are, are people in this room. Um, one of the things I would like to call on folks to do is, is really find people who are not uh, currently mentoring projects. Um, you know, that GSOC has historically been a great program for us to bring new people into FreeBSD. Um, and so if there is, um, if there's interesting work that you would like to, um, to mentor, um, it's, it's great to get it into the project's ideas list um, for GSOC and then mentor um, in the future. Um, from GSOC 2022, we had uh, four new uh, committers who are, are currently still active um, within FreeBSD. Um, in 2023, I think we have three people who are still quite, um, still, still quite active, um, uh, including two who are, are doing quite a lot of, of work. Um, and then from, from this list here, um, you can see um, uh, Getz uh, worked uh, with Robert and me on uh, SIMD uh, LibC instructions. Uh, Guess is still very um, active, came to EuroBSDCon uh, uh, recently, um, and then uh, Benjamin also was at uh, EuroBSDCon. So, um, yeah, that's, um, I think a lot of these projects have landed in the tree now, or, or uh, people have been working um, with the, the students um, even after the GSOC project has ended, um, where the the work was completed within GSOC, but not yet integrated into FreeBSD. And so many of the students have either helped uh, sort of in keep working on it post the GSOC program, or the, the mentors um, have continued on with the work. Um, also, um, Li Wen has had uh, quite a few students in Taiwan um, working on various internship um, projects. So I think it's about 15 uh, people, Li Wen, I think, over time that, that have worked with you, um, and about five uh, who are still quite active. Um, so I think that's, that's we've had a number of, um, of really good quality contributors um, from Li Wen's involvement. Uh, and then I've also had, um, with the UW co-op uh, program, I've, I've had a number of interns working for me in Kitchener um, and some of them are, uh, are still active with the project and um, uh, working, uh, contracting for the foundation as well. So we've had quite a few different avenues of sort of student involvement and, um, and internship mentorship. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the projects that, um, that we've taken on. And this is not an exclusive list, but um, I just want to highlight a, a couple of them. And so here's um, a few different uh, areas or different reasons that we would f uh, choose to focus on a project. And so, um, you know, one of the um, one of the areas will be if it's something that is is really important and is necessary in in FreeBSD. Um, if it is something that is important but the community is not taking on. And so, I think in a lot of times things like developer tools, um, the debugger. Uh, LLDB debugger that we have in the, the base system now, things like that. Often it's important to the community, but no single entity sort of 
says this is where I want to put my resources and take it on, um, you know, uh, so solely take it on. And so that's where the foundation can, can step in. Um, uh, number three here, aligning with foundation goals. This is sort of as we've transitioned into taking a uh, broader and more forward-looking view of um, holistic improvements that we want to make. Um, we've started looking at projects that kind of align with that, um, with, with those goals. And I think that's, that area is, is really what Alice will focus on um, in the talk tomorrow. Um, and then uh, finally, we've got work that needs to be done sort of as new technology is coming, um, new CPUs, new infrastructure is coming on the horizon, um, getting things in place so that um, FreeBSD will be positioned to make use of them as they, they become available. So I have a few projects here that I'm gonna, gonna highlight. These are not necessarily um, in progress. Some of them have been completed. Some of them are, are, are still in progress, but I'll, um, they're, they're interesting for some, um, some reason. So the first one on the list um, is uh, RAID Z expansion, uh, RAID Z expansion. Uh, I guess I'm in the US, so I have to call it RAID Z expansion. Um, and so this is a, a project that um, admittedly has been um, in progress for a very long time. We, we first, started uh, funding this work with Matt Ahrens in 2017. Um, and it's been a long time getting it, um, getting it ready. Um, in 2019, we had an alpha quality pull request. Um, in 2021, we had an updated uh, pull request. And then in 2023, um, Don Brady, with, some, with support from IX Systems, rebased the work, um, incorporated feedback from review, and, and did a bunch of integration work to get it ready to be finally brought in. Um, and I think it's um, uh, one year ago tomorrow that it was merged into uh, Open, OpenZFS uh, Master, and then um, a day after that, it came into FreeBSD in the main branch so that people could test it and explore it. Um, and the reason I think it's, it's relevant now is that um, the next OpenZFS release, 2.3, is, is sort of imminent. It's in progress right now. Um, and it includes this, this feature finally. So it's, um, it's broadly available uh, for people to use. Um, and uh, sorry, I didn't, didn't mention um, sort of what, uh, what the, the project is. Um, and so <laughs> uh, the, the RAID, RAID Z expansion um, it allows you to take a, uh, a RAID Z1, Z2 pool um, that has, say, three disks, and then incrementally add a fourth disk or a fifth disk. And, um, expand it while the, the array is, is in use um, and while it's online and, and grow it um, by a disk at a time. So for a lot of smaller users, um, home users, uh, uh, you know, with a, with a home NAS, it's very convenient to be able to just buy one more disk and, and grow your, um, your pool as you, you, your storage needs grow. Um, so I do not believe it is in stable 14 right now. Um, there is a discussion uh, ongoing about um, uh, what ZFS version to, to put into to 14. Um, in, in part, um, OpenZFS 2.3 is not yet released. Um, and so in FreeBSD main, I think it's reasonable for us to have a snapshot of the development um, development branch in Maine, um, and um, you know, as as I mentioned, it was it went into FreeBSD Maine um, uh, just under um, a year ago, uh, right after it went into OpenZFS uh, Maine. But there were some bug or OpenZFS Master, but there were some bug fixes that happened in OpenZFS after it was integrated, um, and I think the approach that we're taking that the community is taking right now is to stick with open ZFS releases in our releases. Um, and so I, it, it isn't in 14.2. Um, I think there's an ongoing discussion about what the, um, the plan uh, will be for stable 14 and, and eventually 14.3. Um, and I think you know, that is um, really up to the release engineering team to decide what the appropriate, uh, release, engineer, release engineering team and the OpenZFS team in FreeBSD to decide what the appropriate path will be and will support um, bringing this feature in if, um, if, if help is needed. But um, I think it's, we'll follow the community's lead on, on that choice. Um, another ZFS uh, item here, 
Um, this was a proposal that we received um, from Pavel to add hierarchical rate limits to um, ZFS. So if you have a, um, a, a, a ZFS uh, pool, say, supporting virtual machines or in containerized um, uh, applications, um, either if it's multi-tenant or you just have multiple competing um, VMs, uh, there wasn't a, a way to kind of isolate um, or dedicate certain amounts of I.O. to the specific consumers. And so Pavel proposed um, this project and uh, we thought it was a valuable thing. It kind of aligns with our, our, our goal of having ZFS be the file system of choice and, and you know, we, re we really want to see it, um, see it continue to evolve and, and continue to be, um, uh, be well supported and usable um, and, and have be fully featured. Um, and so, you know, we, we we approved this this proposal. The pull request is is listed here. It's um, there's review ongoing, and uh, it, I think it is at a, a state where it needs to be rebased, um, but is is close to being uh, being ready. Another project that we've taken on, uh, Tom Jones did this work um, or, or completed it. Um, so uh, the PF uh, and IPFW NAT implementations. Um, in, implemented what is called endpoint dependent um, mapping NAT. And all it means uh, is, is it basically is just describing the behavior that the NAT uses um, when it chooses the source address um, for your outbound connection. And so um, endpoint independent mapping will use the same, um, the sa the same uh, source if you're connecting to multiple or to different destinations. And the idea is that um, when you have peer-to-peer -peer, um, uh, connections, so if it's um, you know, video conferencing or online gaming, um, there are ways to be able to connect two hosts that are both behind NATs. Um, uh, there, there's ways to basically uh, punch holes through the two NATs to be able to allow those two endpoints to communicate directly, um, but uh, those, those methods only really work um, if, if you're not mapping approach matches this, um, uh, this scheme. And so there was a, um, a patch from, that came from the community uh, that, that was around for a while and uh, that implemented this but was not uh, ready to be integrated. Um, I had a foundation, uh, a University of Waterloo co-op student as an intern who, um, who ported that work forward, uh, rebased it and made it work against the newer version of FreeBSD and added tests to it because the the tests weren't in there originally, um, and that was that got it a lot closer. But it's still um, it, during the course of that that internship and with the other work that uh, that they had um, to, to take on, there wasn't time to get it integrated into FreeBSD. And finally, um, uh, Tailscale, who's a um, a VPN um, uh, startup who um, uses WireGuard and really wanted to be able to support this so that um, VPNs, uh, VPNs are another you know, very important use case of uh, end hosts be behind different NATs wanting to be able to communicate directly. Um, and so we worked with, um, with Tailscale and had Tom um, spend a little bit of time porting the, the work forward again and, and polishing the tests some more and working on um, additional integration efforts. And so that, that work is in the, the tree um, now. Uh, next up, we have uh, an, uh, a project that was uh, sponsored by or supported by the Alpha Omega project, which is um, in the Linux Foundation uh, umbrella and is supported or is a sister project sort of to OpenSSF. Um, their, their goal is to level up security across the open source uh, landscape and they have two kind of categories of projects. So there's alpha projects and omega projects. Um, alpha projects uh, or alpha engagements are ones where they've picked a specific uh, open source community and funded direct work in them. And then the omega um, effort is basically looking at ways to try and provide improved security across the landscape. So things like improving fuzzing or um, you know better uh, security tooling that, that can be applied to a lots of projects fall into the second category. But in the first category, um, uh, Alpha Omega funded us um, specifically 
to do, to start off with a code audit. And so we chose two areas in, uh, in FreeBSD um, that had specific security relevance. And so that was uh, the Beehive hypervisor. Um, and we focused on both kernel and user land uh, device models. Um, and then we wanted to look at kernel code that is reachable from within a capsicum sandbox. Um, and so that's a fairly broad amount of, of kernel code. I mean, that was, you know, there's a lot of leeway in an audit like that to, to search things, but um, that was sort of our, you know, we said if we're using a sandbox um, to run potentially untrusted or, uh, or code that's operating on untrusted data, um, what could it reach in, in kernel? Um, so with, with the funding, um, we contracted an offensive security firm called Synactive uh, in France um, to do a code audit of these two, two areas. Um, they found, I think, uh, 25 or so um, uh, vulnerabilities or um, 25 issues. Some of them are, um, are exploitable vulnerabilities um, of high severity. Some of them are just sort of code cleanliness or, or remark level you know, uh, improvements to be made. But um, they, they produced this, uh, this report for us and then foundation staff and contractors and members of the community with support um, from, from the foundation produced fixes for these. And I think we had um, something like nine or so security advisories that have gone out over the last, in, in three batches over the last um, uh, month and a bit that have addressed the, the issues that they've reported. And so you know, the, the vulnerabilities are now fixed. Um, but one of the additional items in our, our list related to this was that we are going to produce a final report that talks about what the classes of issues they found are and ways that we can try and address this in a more holistic way in FreeBSD. So whether it's um, advice for our developer community or it's tooling or whatever it might be, um, ways that we can avoid those specific kinds of issues uh, in the future. Um, another one, this is why AMD is, is prominent on the sponsored commit list, um, is that um, they've funded uh, the work that Caustic's been doing to implement an IOMMU driver for AMD. So an IOMMU is, um, you know, it's, it provides memory management, uh, virtual memory, for devices the same way that the MMU does for um, uh, processes uh, you know, in, a, in, a, um, in an OS. And the motivation for us on, um, to, to start this on AMD um, was really that uh, we are looking at high core count systems. And so we, we have a system with 512 um, individual threads. It's 256 times two hyper threads. Um, and, um, the, uh, the way that, absent an IOMMU, we basically are unable to support the number of interrupts that a system like this um, uh, is, um, uh, requires um, in order to, to be able to, to route interrupts to that number of, of um, CPUs. And we have a workaround that went into FreeBSD um, that's in, in, in 14 um, now that makes the system functional, but uh, performance might be suboptimal. So basically devices that are on um, CPUs that happen to be in the, the bad range, um, we just, you know, the, we're not able to service uh, interrupts on those CPUs. So this, the interrupts are um, handled by CPUs that, that happen to fall in the, the good range. So depending on how your system is configured, you, you might or might not um, have uh, the performance you expect. Um, this work is, uh, is, is in the tree now, um, the commit is, is listed there, um, and so we're doing some a little bit more testing and um, uh, debugging, but um, it's usable and um, uh, uh, solves the, the problems that we uh, had. Um, very briefly, uh, we ported VPP to FreeBSD, so VPP is Vector Packet Processor. Um, it's basically a user land uh, network stack that's built on top of DPTK or NetMap and provides high performance uh, routing and switching type capabilities. Um, and it was developed initially on, um, on Linux um, 
using DPTK as the interface for getting pack, uh, data from um, the NICs into user space and um, Tom Jones, this was a project that Tom Jones took on, um, uh, bringing it to FreeBSD, it's upstream, um, it is upstream now and it's in our, our ports collection um, and one of the, um, one of the BPP developers um, has a couple of blog posts um, as he tried out the, the port and sort of um, his first experience with, with FreeBSD bringing it up, bringing BPP up on, on FreeBSD and his test bed and, and his experiences um, with it. So uh, I think there's still a little more work that we're gonna do to polish this and, and make it um, a little bit uh, more approachable, but it, it is upstream and in our ports collection now. Um, on this list we have um, a couple of, of projects where we've been facilitating facilitating effort within the community, although we haven't sort of contributed directly uh, technically to it. And so the .NET project um, has been, the, the port of Microsoft.NET to FreeBSD has been ongoing for quite a long time by community members. Um, and the foundation has provided um, uh, working group meetings and dis discussions with um, various vendors and try just tracking um, requests that are open and bugs and just sort of trying to find um, places where things are getting stalled and, and moving things along. Um, and then uh, OCI containers, uh, support for OCI containers is the same um, sort of story. Um, Doug Rabson is the, the main contributor of effort um, to this, uh, this project of late. Um, you know, not, not working for the foundation, but uh, we've supported the effort and, um, and provided um, operational support as necessary. And then finally, the, the last three um, items on here are places where the foundation staff or contractors have provided operational support to the project. So you know, foundation folks have uh, contributed to cluster admin. Um, Lee Wen does, uh, manages our CI environment and keeps things up to date. Um, and then Mark Johnson and myself uh, spend some time on the security team uh, supporting vulnerability uh, advisories. Um, and then finally, um, two big projects are underway now. Um, this is what Alice will talk about a little bit tomorrow, so I don't um, want to go into it too, too much, but Alice's talk is going to be more about the way that we're managing projects within the foundation now and, and our, the way our capabilities are going to be leveling up. Um, so there's a couple of um, sort of interesting technical um, comments I'll make um, here. And so um, the laptop uh, effort is supporting our our goal within the foundation of making the laptop experience, uh, the end user experience on FreeBSD on a laptop uh, improved for developers and for um, students, university students, uh, people like that as our motivating use case. We really want to make sure that people who are developing FreeBSD are able to do it with FreeBSD as their, their desktop environment. And so, I mean, you can see I'm presenting from a, a framework um, laptop here. Um, we've been working with framework and um, they've been contributing a lot of effort to, to improve specific parts of FreeBSD um, in this environment. Um, and then finally, the infrastructure project. Um, this is the, the effort that we are, uh, the contract we have with the um, Sovereign Tech Agency to work on a number of different um, uh, work, pro uh, work packages to improve uh, things in FreeBSD, including um, cleaning up some technical debt, um, cleaning, work, working on the, the bug backlog, um, improving some CI and CD in ports, um, and then uh, finally some, some supply chain tooling, and so things like automated SBOM generation for all of the, the content that's, the third party content that's included in FreeBSD, um, topics like that are, are gonna be included. But Alice will talk a little bit more about um, the, uh, well, well, Alice will talk in detail about the way that we're taking on projects um, now and the capabilities that the foundation is, um, is growing into. Um, so with that, uh, thank you. Uh, I have a, maybe a couple of minutes for, no, I, I do not have any time for questions. So uh, we will go to our break, uh, our break now. And if you have any questions, meet me in the, the break room and we can discuss. Thank you. <laughs>